Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, And we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge and let's talk about some true crime. Well, welcome back to Killer Queens. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Uh, I'm, you know what we haven't done in a long time? Oh, you know what? It's in our intro. Oh. Still, I'm Torella. And I'm Tori. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we should have faked everybody out. And I'd be like, I'm Torella. Because <laughs> <laughs> then they'd be like, be well, like... I thought, but I thought I knew your names. <laughs> I thought I knew which voice was whose. You think so? Well, all I said was, <laughs> <laughs> some people say that they know who's talking and who's not. Yeah, but not. they think they know and they have no idea. Well, yeah, because this is the Diary of Killer Queens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so this is, you know, uh, Killer Queens. Welcome back or welcome for the first time. It's the true crime podcast for 90s lovers. When did you start this? Just today. Okay. <laughs> yep. You didn't okay it by me, so I didn't know you that that's to what be we were doing. You seemed to be it when I did it the first time. Well, because I thought it was a one-time thing. Now that it's an every-time thing, I don't know how to feel. Mm-mm. No, everything I do is an every-time thing until somebody tells me. Bids me stop. Bids you stop. And also, I feel like sometimes whenever there is something that I'm like, oh, this is what we do every time, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you stop doing it. I can do whatever I want. It's my prerogative. Okay, Brittany, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So there we have it. All right. So today we're going to be covering, this is a pretty famous case, I would say. Yeah. And before we do that, we have got a Patreon. So check it out. <laughs> That's the way you wanted to bring it up. I mean, you're free to bring anything up you want to. I don't even want to be here right now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just didn't know that's how you were going to do it. But yeah, let's talk about the Patreon. So we have a Patreon. And if you're into extra episodes and or ad free episodes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Patreon's for you. Oh, yeah. That's the place to be. It's really got it going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've got it going on for you. Oh my God, I love that song. Me too. We do three episodes a week. Yeah, we do. Two of which are on Patreon. Yeah, they are. So, you know, and you get early access to part twos. Part dis. So ideally, you could get an episode Wednesday. You can get one Friday. You can get one Saturday. Boom. And then if it's a two-parter, you head right right back over there. You don't even leave the app. And Mm-mm. you just got an extra episode right there. You sure do. And when you join, you got, golly, how many episodes now? Just over golly. 100 mixtapes. Golly. Golly. <laughs> you got 100 mixtapes at least. Yeah. Millions of doc jams. Millions, yeah. That's not an exaggeration. Many. There's plenty so, of things to binge if you're into binging. For sure. Once and no you ads. Get to drinking, you get to binging. Exactly. Yep. And no ads. Not a one. Nope. Not one to be found. Mm-mm. So, you know, I think we've done, I think we've done all we can do here. <laughs> I was say, do you think that, that covers it? <laughs> I think it covers it. I'm annoying myself. You have been annoying me. Well, I sure. think we're good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Once it's past just me annoying you, it's a problem. <laughs> all right. So now we can get into the case. And thank you to Britt Tracy, Brandy Powell, Rhea, Jessica. Beat, yep, and Ashton Samantha for requesting it, and that's not Samantha. What does it say? Oh, it sure does not. Wow, <laughs> Samaha, I need to get my Samaha. eyes checked. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> Just making up words. Well, you know how, like, if I were to put a word in front of you and the first letter and the last letter are right, your brain. Just automatically does the decides rest. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened. <laughs> I think that's what happened to me because I was like S and S, Samantha. Got okay. It. Yes. Well, and all of the words or all the letters are in the correct order. They're just missing some. I bet she gets that a lot. I bet she does too. It's kind of how you get Patrice. <laughs> Which is so weird. It is Out very... of all the things I could get a lot, I get Patrice the absolute most. Yes. And people are like, wow, that's a really cool name. I'll never forget your name. I'm like, shut your mouth. You've already forgot it. And they're like, no, I haven't, Patrice. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. You're right. So, you didn't forget it. Thank you so much for requesting it. And thank you to Madison for writing it up. 
Hey, girl, thanks. Yes. And we do have a trigger warning. This case has mm-hmm. to do with child murder and sexual assault. So if that's something that you don't need in your life and don't need to hear about, we totally get it. And we'll catch you on the next episode. No big deal. Yes, 100%. Yes. All right. So if you're not familiar with the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders, we will give you a synopsis. Brief overview. Sure. On the morning of Sunday, June 12th, 1977, over 100 young girls and their families gathered at the Girl Scout headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if you think that you're going to get out of this without me singing, take me back to Tulsa. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Dead wrong. Here we go. Dead wrong. Yep. Here we are. Well, now it's already stuck in my head. So thanks. (laughs) My work here is done. It is good. It's a good song. Yeah. Reminds me of Uncle Joe. I know. Everyone was saying their goodbyes as the girls loaded onto their buses and headed for Camp Scott, just about an hour away in Mays County, Oklahoma. The Girl Scout camp promised two weeks of adventure, swimming, horseback riding, crafts, and hiking. Some of the girls were excited for the trip, but others were a little nervous about spending two entire weeks away from their families. I would be in that party. 100%. I think I would have done well with that. However, within 24 hours, the girls would be back on the buses headed back to Tulsa with no explanation as to why. Three girls, eight-year-old Lori Farmer, nine-year-old Michelle Goose, and 10-year-old Denise Milner had been found dead that morning, laying in the woods about 100 feet from their tent. There was clear evidence of foul play. Almost two years later, after the largest manhunt in Oklahoma history, a man was arrested and charged with their murders. However, much of the community was not convinced that this was the man behind the massacre. The trial turned the courtroom and the community into a circus and seemed to forget about the most important question. Who killed Lori, Michelle, and Denise? So let's talk about the victims. Lori Lee Farmer was born on June 18th, 1968, and was eight years old when she left for camp. The brown-eyed, blonde-haired girl was the youngest of the campers and was a year younger than everyone in her class. She'd skipped a grade at school, so she was used to being a little smaller than everyone else. Me too. (laughs) I didn't skip a grade. But you did not skip a grade. I did not skip a grade, no. I've always just been tiny. Her parents said that she was a smart girl, and that's why the school suggested she skip second grade. She had just graduated from fourth grade at Jinx Elementary when her parents signed her up for camp. Her ninth birthday would fall while she was at camp, so her parents decided they'd drive up for the day and celebrate with her. Lori was the oldest of five children to parents Dr. Charles Bow Farmer, an emergency department physician, and Sherry Farmer. Her parents described her as a caring and nurturing little girl. She was very helpful with her younger siblings. Lori had been begging her parents to go to summer camp, but couldn't decide between Girl Scouts or the Girl Scout camp and the YMCA's camp. Sherry ultimately decided that Lori would go to the Girl Scout camp and which week she'd go. Mm. She said that this was a decision that has haunted her for the rest of her life. That is so sad. Michelle Heather Goose or Goose, we've heard it both ways was born on February 23rd, 1968, and she was nine years old. She'd been a Girl Scout since 1974 and attended Camp Scott the prior summer. She had been telling her parents, George Ann and Richard Goose, how excited she was to go back to camp, but she wanted to make sure that her parents watered her African violets. Michelle was immensely proud of her flowers and wanted to make sure they were taken care of while she was away. She was active in sports and loved playing on the soccer team. Her father felt as though Michelle had some sort of premonition prior to leaving for camp. She hugged her parents goodbye and Richard felt like she knew she wouldn't be coming home from camp. He said that the way she said goodbye was like she knew she wouldn't be seeing them again. Oh my gosh. So sad. There's no amount of anything that gets you used to hearing something like that. No. Talk about young children. Oh my gosh. Doris Denise Milner was born on February 5th, 1967, and was 10 years old when she attended Camp Scott. Her friends and family called her Denise. Denise was a smart girl who'd been recently accepted to Carver Middle School. She was a straight-A student and couldn't wait to attend her new school in the fall. She was initially very excited to go to camp that summer. She told she'd sold cookies that year to be able to attend, and a few of her friends would be going too. Unfortunately, at the last minute, her friends were unable to go and Denise grew increasingly anxious about going to camp and not knowing anyone. Her mother, Betty Milner, convinced her to go, hoping it'd help her to become more independent. She promised her that she could call home anytime she was lonely and that she'd come pick her up if she was too homesick. Denise was the only, was one of the only African-American girls at the camp and was still incredibly unsure about leaving for camp on the morning of. 
Fortunately, a new counselor took her under her wing and rode with her on the bus. On Sunday, June 12th, the Magic Empire Council headquarters in Tulsa was buzzing with excitement. There were over 100 Girl Scouts with their families waiting to board the buses to take them to Camp Scott. Some of the girls were ready to say goodbye to mom and dad, while others were much more hesitant. Denise was one of the hesitant ones. Fortunately, 15-year-old veteran camper Michelle Hoffman noticed her hesitation and introduced herself to Denise and her mother. She told him this would be her seventh summer at Camp Scott, and although she'd aged out of the range for campers, she was going to be an aide for the camp director. Denise's mother told Michelle that her daughter was very anxious for her first camping experience, so Michelle asked Denise to ride up front in the bus with her. Denise stayed mostly quiet throughout the bus ride, but Michelle was convinced she'd perk up once they arrived at camp. Camp Scott was a 400-acre area in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. It had been operated by the Girl Scouts since 1928. The camp was split into 10 different units, each unit housing about seven tents for girls and one for counselors. The tents were named after different Indian tribes. There was also a great hall, an arts and crafts building, and a swimming pool. The tents were about 12 by 14 feet with thick canvas around them that could be rolled up. The tents sat atop wooden platforms and each had four cots inside. When the girls arrived to the campsite, Michelle stayed by Denise's side. They found that Denise was assigned to the Kiowa unit, tent number eight. Michelle told Denise that number eight in Kiowa was her favorite tent. It was close to the bathroom and kitchen area. The tents in Kiowa were arranged in a semicircle with the counselor's tent on one end and the tent eight on the far side. Kiowa was the most secluded unit of the camp and tent eight was the most secluded tent. I wonder why, if you're in a semicircle, can't you put the counselor kind of in the middle? You would think, I mean... That seems to me like the best way to go for observing everything around you, like being super in it and being aware, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I just wonder why they did that. Once Michelle walked Denise to her tent, Denise met her two tent mates, Lori Farmer and Michelle Goose. There was supposed to be a fourth camper assigned to Kiowa 8, but a clerical error had sent her to another tent. Just so many things that you hear about that you're like, that is so huge, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like such a small thing if nothing happened, but because of what happened, it's so huge. Exactly, yeah, it changes everything. Yeah. For the first night, it would just be the three girls. Kiowa had three counselors, Carla Wilhite, 23 years old, D. Elder, 20, and Susan Emery, 18. Once everyone was settled into their tents and familiar with their area, the girls and counselors went to dinner in the Great Hall. On the way back from the dinner, the sky opened up and it started to pour. A huge thunderstorm ensued, forcing the girls to spend the evening in their tents. As tradition was, each of them wrote a letter home. These are the letters that Michelle, Lori, and Denise wrote that evening. So first we'll read Lori's letter. Dear Mommy, Daddy, Misty, Jolie, and Kaylee, we're just getting ready to go to bed. It's 745. We're at the beginning of a storm and having a lot of fun. I've met two new friends, Michelle, Goose, and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. It started raining on the way back from dinner. We're sleeping on cots. I couldn't wait to write you. We're all writing letters now because there's hardly anything else to do. Love, Lori. I love like little kids, like the content of their letters. Exactly. Like, it's so sweet. <laughs> it is sweet. Michelle's letter. Dear Aunt Karen, how are you? I'm fine. I'm writing from camp. We couldn't go outside because it's storming. Me and my tent mates are in the last tent in our unit. My tent mates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmer. My room is in shades of purple. Love, Michelle. <laughs> Just very like, here to are the, the points. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Denise's letter. Dear mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day it rained. I have three new friends named Glinda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. Oh my goodness. Poor sweet baby. I know. She didn't like it. And you know, I mean, if she was given the chance, she probably would have turned that, that attitude probably would have turned around. Oh yeah, for sure. She probably would have ended up having a really good time. She was mm -hmm. just so nervous and it's I would have first been, day. Yeah, I would have been the same way. Especially if like your friends that were supposed to go weren't going to go. Yeah. You're like, okay, well now I don't know anybody. Exactly. Though there was still a lot of horseplay going on inside of the tents, around 8 p.m. the girls had begun to settle in. It was incredibly dark and the counselors all carried flashlights as they moved around the camp, checking on their girls and making sure everybody was ready for bed. The girls had been told that if they had to leave their tents, they needed to be sure to take a flashlight and a buddy. 
Sometime between 8 and 10 p.m., a counselor from the Comanche unit noticed a dim light in the woods surrounding the camp. So the flashlight in the buddy system makes sense to me unless you're in a tent that had a clerical error where you only had three campers. Because if you take a buddy, then one's left in the tent. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. What did they expect the girls with three to do? I have no idea. Unless they all three went together. But if the clerical error made them have three in their tent, they then couldn't be, have had five in another tent. I was going to so. say either overcrowding or somebody who didn't go last yeah. minute or something. I don't know. Sometime between 8 and 10 p.m., a counselor... Oh, wait. She pointed her flashlight towards it and it went off. She then turned her flashlight off and waited. The dim light turned back on and began moving towards the Kiowa tent. At 10 p.m., a counselor does a tent check in Kiowa and all the appeared well. Around midnight, Kiowa counselor Carla heard laughter and noise coming from the latrine area. <gasps> latrine. <laughs> <laughs> Better than shit house. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good change. <laughs> she left her tent and herded the girls back to their tent. Around 1.30 a.m., the counselors hear laughter coming from tent six. Carla and another counselor shine their flashlights at the tent and go over to quiet the girls down. While there, the two counselors hear what they describe as a low guttural sound coming from the woods behind tents one and two. Though scared by the noise, the two counselors attributed it to an animal and returned to their tent to sleep. Sometime during the night, a camper, a camper in tent seven recalled that she saw a light outside their tent. The flap of their tent opened, the light shined into the tent, and they saw a male figure. The tent flap then closed. Several girls later reported that during the night, they'd heard girls screaming but didn't think much of it. One said she heard a girl crying, mama, mama, but didn't know what to do, so she went back to sleep. Oh, God, this is so sad. And these are such young kids. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Oh, it's so sad. Carla awoke early the next morning from her prior years at camp. She knew that the earlier she got to the showers, the more likely she was to get hot water. It was around 6 a.m. and the sun had just started to come up. Carla left her tent and headed towards the road to walk to the showers. As she began, something caught her attention on the other side of the road. She saw several sleeping bags and assumed they'd been dropped off or they dropped off some luggage that had arrived late. She walked over and what she saw stunned her. Three sleeping bags, a yellow plaid one, a dark green one, and one with a red flower pattern. A young girl was laying partially on and underneath one of the sleeping bags. Carla initially wondered why the young girl was sleeping outside of her tent before she realized that something was very wrong. She saw two other sleeping bags not too far away but didn't approach them. Carla ran back to the Kiowa counselor's tent and woke them, telling them that she'd found a child's body. She insisted that they check all of Kiowa's tents. They found that tent eight was empty with blood stains throughout the tent. Carla instructed Dee and Susan to stay in the Kiowa area and not to let any of the girls out of their tents. She ran to the nurse's quarters and told her there was a body in the woods. The nurse got dressed and ran to her car to drive down to the Kiowa unit. Carla continued to wake up camp counselor or camp director, Barbara Day and her husband, Richard. The camp nurse arrived on the scene quickly along with Richard and Barbara. The young girl who was later identified as Denise Milner lay partially on top and underneath her sleeping bag. She was nude from the waist down and had visible wounds and blood on her face and head. The nurse reached down to feel for a carotid pulse, but was unable to find one. She then reached to grab the girl's wrist to feel for a pulse, but then realized Denise's hands were bound behind her back. Richard Day looked towards the other two sleeping bags. He didn't open them, but he felt their weight and knew that there must have been a child in each of them. He covered Denise's lower half with a sleeping bag. Barbara Day got on the phone and called the highway patrol while her husband went to wake Camp Ranger Ben Woodward. Ben lived on site with his wife and children. Ben and Richard checked the entrance gate to the camp and found it was still locked. Ben had returned to the camp late the prior evening after picking up his daughter from her job in town. He locked the gate behind him upon his return. The other counselors throughout the camp gathered their girls and quickly escorted them to the Great Hall for breakfast. They kept the girls busy throughout the morning until the buses arrived to return the girls to Tulsa. The girls were very confused as to why they had to leave after one night. Some scouts remembered being told that there was a problem with the swimming pool or with the drinking water. Others heard that there was an accident, but no one could guess the magnitude of what had actually happened. The girls were, the parents were notified that there had been an accident and that they needed to return to the Magic Empire Counselor Headquarters, Council Headquarters to pick up their children. 
Counselors on scene were searching through camp paperwork to find out exactly which girls were missing. They didn't do that before they stuck everybody on buses? I mean, you would think that they would. (laughs) And I know that from that documentary that we watched, the parents didn't know anything. Like, they didn't know which ones were missing until they got there. It's it's very reminiscent of like Sandy Hook. Uh-huh. Where, and I mean, I, I get that there's not a protocol for something like this specifically happening, but it does seem, I mean, after the fact and us not being in that panicky, you know, like emergency situation to be like, why didn't you guys do that before? But it is kind of crazy. Yeah. Also, if it's the first real day of camp, all the counselors may not know everybody in there. Oh, I'm unit. sure they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Still. I don't know. It's crazy. Like, who was assigned to that tent? Like, yeah. Well, there were three counselors for, what, eight tents? Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get to the investigation. The farmers, the Milners, and the Gousses all remember June 13th vividly. They remember exactly how they found out that their daughters were dead. Betty Milner recalled the exact words, Denise is dead, she and two other girls. Betty asked if there'd been an accident, like... An accident is something her brain could process a reason for her daughter's death. And they told her, no, she'd been beaten to death. She remembered she immediately felt fear, fear that she couldn't protect her remaining daughter. Like, yeah, in what world are you, like, first of all, you're not expecting anything to happen, but something like she fell off of, you know, like She fell off a tree. She, yeah. Yeah. Just so sad. Mm-hmm. Dr. Farmer was working at the hospital when he received a call from someone at the Magic Empire Council headquarters. They told him that his daughter, Lori, had been found dead out behind their tent. They gave no details. He drove home with one of his colleagues to tell his wife that Lori was dead. He later found that before contacting him, the executive director of the council had made two other phone calls to the Girl Scouts insurance company and to their attorney. <laughs> before contacting him. Of course. Wow. Let's save our asses. Mm-hmm. The Gousse said that someone knocked on their door and told them that there'd been an accident and that Michelle was found dead. It wasn't until they turned on the news later that they learned that she'd been murdered. Why can we not tell the families before they hear it from somebody else? It's not an ideal job. No, but they have the right to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, if anybody has a right to know. And don't you think that you could definitely kind of shape that situation and that conversation a little bit better than the media would. You could exactly let them because down the gently. media is going to try to get it make it as salacious as possible, you know, so people want to tune into it. Exactly. Awful. Mm-hmm. Several things were revealed after the murders that may have predicted that something ominous was going to happen at Camp Scott. When the counselors arrived prior to the scouts arrival, they found that one of the tents in the Kiowa unit had a large slash across the campus. They were able to repair it and didn't think much of it. Hmm. They were able to repair it and didn't think much of it. Supposedly, several weeks before the murders, counselors who were attending a training session at Camp Scott discovered a menacing note in a donut box inside one of the buildings. It reportedly said something along the lines of, four girls will be murdered at your campsite, as well as some odd things about Martians. The counselors who found it believed it to be a prank and threw it away. Oh my God. Again, what are you going to do? What are the police going to do? You know, hey, I found a note that said somebody's going to be murdered. Okay, well, were they murdered? Then we can't do anything. I'm sure would be the answer. But it, God, and then three people were. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it just sucks. It does. Investigators quickly arrived on scene along with the medical examiner. Highway Patrol Officer Harold Berry was the first officer on scene. He recalled seeing only one set of footprints, or I'm sorry, boot prints that led from tent eight to where the girls were found. Although he immediately secured the area where the bodies were, the surrounding camp area was not secured until much later. It's unclear when exactly someone opened the other two sleeping bags, but it was a significant amount of time after the bodies were discovered. The medical examiner pronounced all three girls deceased on scene. He said that Denise's body felt warm enough that he speculated she had not been dead very long and that she was the last to die. One of the other bags contained Lori, who investigators said didn't have any obvious signs of injury when lying face up. They said it was almost as though she were asleep. And the last sleeping bag was Michelle, who had obvious trauma to the head. Her hands were also bound behind her back. 
It wasn't long before local law enforcement called in the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, the OSBI, to assist with the case. As they canvassed the area, investigators found many things that were out of the ordinary. Flaps of the counselor's tent and tent eight had been taken off their hook screws. Several items were missing from the counselor's tent as well, including purses and eyeglasses. Tent 8 had blood across the wooden platform door and on the canvas walls. The blood on the floor appeared to be smeared as if someone had tried to wipe it with the mattress covers and towels that were later found in the girls' sleeping bags. There was a bloody boot print that measured a size 9.5 on the floor. There were several items that were reported as being found beside the bodies or not far away. A roll of black duct tape, nylon cord or rope, a large red box flashlight, three empty beer bottles, and several pairs of prescription glasses. The box flashlight had a piece of black plastic over the front of it with a small hole in the middle, and this was believed to be used to obscure the light while the attacker moved around the camp. From the evidence inside of the tent and the scene, investigators believed that the attacker entered from the rear of tent eight struck both Michelle and Lori as they lay in bed. It's likely they both died inside the tent and were put inside their sleeping bags and then carried to where they were found. Denise had been found with a hand-sewn piece of fabric used as a gag around her mouth and some type of ligature around her neck. They believe that Denise may have been bound or incapacitated while inside the tent and then carried to the area where she was found to be killed. The medical examiner determined that the cause of death for Lori and Michelle was blunt force trauma to the head. He said that although Denise also had head trauma, her ultimate cause of death was strangulation. All three girls' injuries showed excessive force and overkill. There was also apparently clear evidence at least that at least two of the girls, if not all three, had been sexually assaulted. And you just hope to God that it happened after they were... Yes. So murdered. young. Yeah. Mm. Awful. There were several pieces of evidence on found on scene, a fingerprint on the box flashlight, a boot print in blood inside the tent, semen in or on all three girls, as well as a semen-stained pillow case. Gross. I feel like- That's a lot of semen. I was going to say, it's like super bad, where Seth Rogen's like, you think that semen's going to be on everything. And, and in, in this, this case, case it, it, is. it is. Yeah. Yeah, or- Russell Williams. Well, Yeah. Or like in the sweetest thing when she brings the oh the dress to the dry yes, cleaner and yes. the girls are like wow he was holding a lot like why <laughs> I just don't I just you just don't I just hate I'm not gonna say I hate men no because you but don't. I think everybody knows it at this point no I'm just <laughs> no. kidding but it's just ugh, you it hate me, what some men are capable of I hate this yeah, yeah. like it's just so disgusting. There's just no words. I just can't. Yeah, Ugh, I can't. And it's, again, we've talked about it so many times. It's because somebody needed to get the rocks off. Yes, which is just so horrible. Mm -hmm. Like, and they're, these are children. Ugh. Yes. There was a dark colored hair found on the duct tape that was used to bind Denise. There was also a crowbar found on the scene. However, this has never been confirmed or denied as being the murder weapon. The park ranger who lived on site quickly cleared of any involvement. His wife provided an alibi for him throughout the night. Focus turned quickly to a farmer named Jack Schroff. Schroff owned a farm about a mile west of Camp Scott. He reported that his farm had been broken into multiple times and several things were stolen, including black duct tape and cord that resembled what was used to bind the girls. Schroff had alibis for the nights of the murders and passed a lie detector test, so he was cleared. He added that his farmhouse had been broken into in the past, so this wasn't completely abnormal. In July of that year, as the investigation continued, some officers worked out of Camp Scott's Great Hall. It was reported that one morning they woke up to find a bag containing a pair of black, pink socks and shoes that had the name Denise Milner written inside. Denise's mother insisted her shoes had not been among the things returned to her. Other officers heard noises throughout the night, the nights there, and found footprints. They believed that someone was taunting them. They even reported putting thread up between the trees to find it broken in the morning. So not a booby trap, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, do we try barbed wire next time? I don't yeah, I know. think we do. Razor wire, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Heading up the investigation was Mays County Sheriff Pete Weaver. Weaver had another suspect in mind, 33-year-old Jean Leroy Hart. 
Hart was a native of the area and a Cherokee Indian. He'd been a popular, good-looking football star in high school and was pretty well-known within the community. Despite his seemingly normal life, Hart was arrested after kidnapping two pregnant women and raping at least one of them. Wow. Stand-up guy. Peaked in high school. What's the uncle's name? Uh, oh, Uncle Rico. It's like Sounds oh. like Leroy, but no. No. <laughs> Not at all. Uncle Rico. Yeah. Yeah. I see what I did there. Yeah. You, you fucked it up. Either way, he peaked in high school. That's sure. Yes, he did. And I know he could not get that pigskin over the mountains. Hell no. No. In 1966, in two separate incidents, Hart held each pregnant woman at gunpoint and forced her into the trunk of a vehicle. Mm. He drove them to a secluded area, pulled them in the backseat, and either raped or attempted to rape them. The women recalled him not speaking, but making strange low noises that didn't sound human-like. Ew. He took at least one of the women's eyeglasses and used them multiple times. Afterwards, he placed a rag in their mouths, wrapped tape around their mouths and eyes and nostrils, and covered them with brush and left them in the woods to die. <laughs> Fortunately, they both escaped alive. He was just going to... It's like he buried them alive, essentially. Yeah. I don't understand how so many people rallied around this dude. <laughs> I really don't either. It is kind of interesting, though, like whenever I heard the story at first, whenever they said the two pregnant women, I was like, how did he find two pregnant women at the same time to kidnap? But it's compl- it's separate... Mm-hmm. incidents, but completely the same. Yeah, which is like, it can't really get worse. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, it's almost worse, but it's at least the same. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's almost like if he'd found both of them at the same time, it would almost be a little less, you know, because no. it's like, okay, well, at least it wasn't two, two completely separate times where he like planned it, executed it, found somebody. It's like, hey guys, he's not going to stop doing this. No. In fact, he's just going to get more emboldened. Yeah, seems that way. Hart pled guilty and was sentenced to three consecutive 10-year sentences. He was imprisoned at May County Jail about 18 miles away from Camp Scott. During his stay, Hart escaped from prison but was quickly caught. Wildly enough, Hart was released on parole after serving (laughs) only 28 months. 28 months! He was supposed to be there for 30 years and he escaped. Mm Mm-hmm. And they let him out after 28 months. And they fucking let him out after two years. Yes. And while he was out on parole in 1969, Hart was arrested for burglary in Tulsa. He was then sentenced to life. Mm -hmm. He was returned to Mays County Jail to serve his sentence. In 74, (laughs) Hart and a few other prisoners escaped by using a hacksaw. When the murders occurred in 77, Hart had still not been caught. Being a Cherokee native, Hart had plenty of family members and friends in the area who could and would be willing to house him despite his issues with the law. His mother's home was not far from Camp Scott. During the search of the area, a cave was located about three miles away from the camp. In this cave, there were signs that someone had been living inside of it. They found a newspaper that was the same date and issue to match a piece of newspaper that had been found inside of the red box flashlight at the murder scene. Uh, The piece had been used to help make the battery, like, have a better connection inside of the flashlight. And they also found duct tape and pieces of dark plastic material that matched what was used to cover the lens of the box flashlight. So essentially, they stumbled upon his shop. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In addition to these items, they found two pictures of different women, a pair of red lace panties, and glasses that were identified as some that had been stolen from the Camp Scott counselor's tent. The two photos appeared to be wedding photos and were the best lead that police had to go on to figure out who had been living in the cave. They publicized the two photos in the newspapers and on television. Luckily, a prison officer recognized the photos. As his part-time job, he was a wedding photographer. Hart had often helped him develop photos at the prison as part of his photography course. Hmm. A second cave was found approximately two weeks following the murders. A farmer called in that said that he'd seen farm... God damn it. We can say fart. Can we call him fart? (laughs) Okay. I think we should because the word is heart and and you definitely said a sound. So I feel like you were going to go that he'd seen fart in the woods. Well, it was, yes. So the farmer and it's in the dell. Yeah. Well, it's not the dell. No, it has to be heart. But then I, I went with the F's. Except this guy. A farmer called in that he had seen fart in the woods. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we won't be children the whole time. 
but I want to. I don't know. Maybe we will. <laughs> we did We did do Ruffle the whole time in the Angie Simota case. And now when anybody comments on it, they call him Ruffle too. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah. The cave was found nearby. Outside of it, there were four small piles uh, where fires had been burning arranged in a semicircle. There were multiple cigarette butts on the ground as well as filters that had been snapped off of the cigarettes. An OSBI agent on scene was also a Cherokee himself, recognized the setup and the fact that the filters had been torn from the cigarettes as a native Indian smoke ritual. The DNA on the butts revealed that the smoker had type O blood. Hart had type O blood. So do I. There, oh, it was you. It was me. Where were I you in 1977? Semen. Yes. <laughs> there was a footprint inside of the cave that matched the one that had been found in tent eight. However, Fart wore a size 11 <laughs> shoe. You weren't expecting That's it. Stupid fart. <laughs> he has an old fart. <laughs> <laughs> the third cave found about a mile from camp. How many caves does this guy have? Uh, dude, I would just have to go back to jail. I would not be living in no damn caves. Three of them. Well, if you had three though, you could have I like, would live in none and I would go back oh. to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do caves. <laughs> yeah. Because not my jam. In real life, caves have things like spiders and Exactly. Yeah. And they're like wet and damp and cold. I could hardly handle with the but the fires. Don't like it. Okay. Okay. I mean, I couldn't handle with the heat turned off for 10 minutes up here to record. <laughs> True. I had to go get a jacket. I was shivering. Oh my God, if you don't quit talking about it. <laughs> so the third camp found about a mile from camp. The third cave, God bless it. The third yeah. cave found about a mile from camp was revealed to police by a prisoner. He said that he'd met Fart there after the murders. <laughs> every time you laugh, every time, because <laughs> I think you'll quit and then you don't. No, and it's, it's funny. It is funny, isn't it? At the time, the prisoner was sixteen years old. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Investigators found graffiti written on the outside. It read seventy-seven six seventeen. The killer was here. Bye, bye, fools. <laughs> What an idiot. Bye bye fools. Bye bye fools. That's like a mixture of Robert Durst and I don't know what. And bye bye fools. I feel like a 16 year old 100% wrote that. Yeah. Bye bye fools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, fool. What the <laughs> killer was here. Yeah, it's so like w what you would use. <laughs> exactly. Like what you would write on a tree in the eighth grade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. And then like a. Fart loves whoever. Forever. <laughs> exactly. With the number four. Yes. Forever. Sheriff Weaver felt strongly that Fart was their man. With this, <laughs> the largest manhunt in the history of the state of Oklahoma ensued. Police, dogs, and aircraft searched the area for weeks looking for any sign of Hart. While the families of the girls who had just been murdered hoped for closure and for the person who hurt their girls to be brought to justice. As the search continued to build momentum, the community seemed to rally around Fart. I got myself with that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Most remembered him to be a quiet, good kid, and a football star. Sure, you could remember somebody as that, but people fucking change. Right. You can't just like live your life in that headspace forever and be like, well, but he used to be a really good kid. Okay, well, he yeah, grew up and now he's a fucking all disgusting the rapes, piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Before all the rapes, though, he was a good guy. Sure. Yeah. And before Richard Ramirez did all the stuff that he did, he was a sweet little three year old. Mm hmm. Exactly. Like, okay. Okay. But now he has done all the rapes. Yeah, exactly. Like, he escaped Ooh. prison twice. Twice. That's what and it was. that almost came out as twizen because. Twizen from Twulfs, Oklahoma. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. Yeah, he escaped prison twice. So he's obviously like a stand up, you know, yeah. citizen. And he was sentenced to 30 years. He got off like with the big time slap on the wrist. Oh my then God. Then he was sentenced to life in prison and he's refusing to comply. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. So. Come on. They didn't believe that he was capable of what he was accused of. The Cherokee community was vocal in their belief that Hart was innocent. His mother, Ella May Buckskin, said that she knew her son was innocent and that Sheriff Weaver was attempting to frame him because he didn't like Indians. Many in Mays County felt that he was a scapegoat because investigators couldn't pin the murders on anyone else. They also felt that Sheriff Weaver held a grudge against Hart after he'd escaped twice from prison. 
uh, good reason to hold a grudge. <laughs> yeah, it's not like because his girlfriend in high school chose to go after fart and not him. I know. It's like, okay, he's well, breaking he's, the law. he's supposed to be serving a life sentence and he's out. And also, it doesn't really do any good. Like, there's no reason to pin something on him. He's already supposed to be serving a life sentence. They just need to find him. Exactly. Like, it's not like they're making an example out of him and this is how they're doing it. Yeah, like it's not like he they held a grudge against him because he was sentenced to 30 years and he got out in two. Right. And during that time he escaped and they're like, we're going to fucking get him now. You yeah, know, exactly. Like he belongs in prison. He needs to go back to prison. Yeah, they would have found him and put him back in prison anyway and he would have served a life sentence. Exactly. Hart had become a sort of legend as the police continued to search for him, which brought lots of unfounded sightings, as well as rumors that Hart was under the protection of Cherokee medicine men. Throughout the rest of 1977 and early 1978, the search for Hart scaled back and media interest declined. Finally, on April 6, 1978, a tip led investigators to the small home of a Cherokee Indian named Sam Pigeon in the hills of eastern Cherokee County. He was brought into custody with no issue. The agent recalled saying to Hart, you killed those little girls, didn't you? To which Hart replied, you'll never pin it on me. He was wearing prescription glasses at the time he was captured. Whose glasses were they? They were a woman's, a women, woman's pairs of glasses. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Just interesting. Yeah, very. They for sure were not, unless, no, they were not his. <laughs> No, because he's already stolen women's glasses like from his victims. Mm -hmm. And then there were also glasses stolen from the camp counselor's yeah. tent. Exactly. And they, the detectives were like, the fact that he was wearing women's glasses was not lost on us. Mm -mm. No. You know? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like it, it connects all of the crimes together and it creates an MO for him. Exactly. As the time for Hart's trial grew near, the community had again rallied for him. The parents of the murdered girls remembered the awkward feeling of walking into restaurants and seeing jars out asking for donations for Jean Hart's defense. That is so terrible. Yeah, can you imagine like you're going somewhere to eat, your daughter has been violently murdered and the person accused of doing this like they'll ask you when you check out or whatever. Do you want to donate hey, to? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to give your change to this? And it's like, no, he killed my child. Like, mm -hmm. no. And you know, at that point, they don't. He's not been convicted, but in their minds, you know, in a, in a victim's family's mind, when the police have typically, when the police have charged somebody and we're getting ready to go to trial, you believe that person murdered your loved one, right? Just horrible. In March of 79, almost two years after the deaths of Lori, Michelle, and Denise, the trial of Jean Leroy Hart began. It was reported that many high-profile lawyers had offered Hart their defense, but he declined. The community felt that the evidence that the police had was either circumstantial or had been planted. <laughs> the photos found in the cave that tied the cave to the murders and the cave to Hart were argued by the defense as having been in the custody of Sheriff Weaver. They said that these photos were in Weaver's desk, but there's no proof of that. Weaver said that he had a signed property receipt for the photos from Hart. The footprint found in the tent was too small for Hart's foot. Hart had also had a vasectomy, but it was later revealed, we're not sure if it was during the trial or afterwards, that the procedure had been unsuccessful and Hart was still producing sperm. So the problem is there, if the vasectomy had taken, there would be no sperm in his semen. Mm -hmm. And so that would be an easy way to either rule him in or out if they found sperm in the semen that they found on the girls. Right. Ugh. I know, I know. But that's also dependent upon the forensics at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. The hair found in the tape that bound Denise Milner was compared to one of Hart's and found to be similar. I mean, but that's all you could do with hair evidence at that time. And it's it's very unsettling to me how many people have been convicted on hair similarity. Right. That's not enough, but uh -uh, no. that was the 70s and 80s. They said that the sperm that was swabbed from the victims also looked similar to hearts. I don't know what that means. Looked. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. On the second search of Sam Pigeon's home where Hart was ultimately found, police found a toy corncob pipe and a small mirror that were identified as belonging to one of the counselors. These items were supposedly in plain view and defense argued that they'd been planted after the police's initial search 
and before their second one. And Hart never ends up taking the stand in his defense. The jury came back with a verdict the following day. They found Hart not guilty for the murders of the three Girl Scouts. And the courtroom exploded. People were celebrating and hugging Hart and his attorney. There was yelling and laughter and a stereo playing from somewhere in the room. How did somebody bring in a stereo? Yeah, let's talk about the size of this alone. (laughs) In the 70s? Mm Mm-hmm. That sucker was as big as your house. Definitely. And they were like, can we move the metal detectors? Because I really got to push the stereo in. Yeah, they didn't have metal detectors then, I'm sure. You don't know that? I guess I don't know that. But they definitely had to have a forklift to get it in there. They were like, we're going to need to take at least one of these walls down to have it fit. Beep, beep, (laughs) beep. Like, hey guys, we need the stereo. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, who would, br- why would they let you bring a stereo in a fucking courtroom? Well, if that's what you're going to do, you might as well just have the marching band come in. That would make a better impression, wouldn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. 76 trombones. <laughs> All right. The parents of Lori, Michelle, and Denise were in absolute disbelief. Ugh. They had to be escorted out of the courthouse by police. It was later found in an anonymous interview with one of the jurors, the decision was not difficult for them. Okay. They felt that there were quite a few loose ends and that the evidence was circumstantial. You also have to think about the fact that even now we're really far behind on understanding evidence and the judicial system and all those things. And like at that time, circumstantial evidence, even though there wasn't a lot in the way of forensics, like... You know, we still have people who will say, yeah, well, that's just circumstantial. That's not enough. When in fact, most cases are that go to trial. Like, well, and we've we've talked about cases that have way less evidence than this. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting. Many speculated that it was easier for the jury to find him innocent because they knew he'd be going back to jail for his previous crimes and serving a life sentence, which I mean does make sense. But it's closure for the families. Yeah, yeah. Prior to the trial, the prosecution had been told that they could not bring up his previous crimes during Hart's trial. Why? Yeah, why? However, the defense, quote, let it slip that Hart would be returning to jail for a life sentence regardless of whether he was found guilty for the murders. That's an interesting tactic to get a not guilty verdict. Yeah, you would think that that would be exactly opposite. Like Mm -hmm. it would be like, oh, well, this guy is a complete nightmare and a very violent criminal. And instead they're like, well, he's going back. I mean, he's got to pick up Santa Claus anyway, so. Well, yeah, exactly. Because it's like usually, yeah, you wouldn't want the jury to know that he's already serving a life sentence because that would be prejudicial. Then they'd be like, oh, well, he must be a really bad guy. Maybe he did do this kind of thing. Yeah. But they- They looked at it like, oh, well, what's the point in- yeah, give him, give us this win. He's going to jail anyway. Why do you need to convict him again? Exactly. Yeah. Ugh. I mean, wow. It worked. Yeah. It seemed pretty clear that the state did not intend to pursue the case further after Hart's verdict. After the trial, the clothing the girls had been wearing when they were murdered was returned to their parents. On June 4th of the same year, the community was stunned to hear that Hart had died in prison. Reports said he suffered a probable heart attack while in the prison yard, which led to cardiac arrest. Hart had a family history of heart problems. Rumors circulated that he'd been poisoned while in prison, but again, nothing was ever substantiated. Upon his death, it was also found that a sample of heart sperm was very similar to the swab of abnormal sperm that was taken from the scene. Mm. I'm just wondering like, why, why they say that kind of stuff in terms of it appeared very similar. Yeah. It looked similar. Like, do they all have all of the sperms? Do they all have the same mustache? Oh. Is that what it is? Maybe some of them also have a monocle. Yeah. They all wear fedoras. How do they look similar? Yeah. What's their identifying factor there? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't either. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Okay. There's got to be something, yeah. though. Um, maybe a sweater vest. Exactly. You don't see many of those. Be. Not nearly enough anymore. No. <laughs> After the trial, the families of Denise Milner and Lori Farmer sued the Magic Empire Council in a civil suit for $5 million, arguing that their negligence in investigating things prior to the murders had resulted in their daughter's deaths. There are many reports that said in the years prior to the murders, there had been several burglaries on the campsite and intruders that had been seen or heard by staff and campers. 
This, in tandem with the reported note left at camp before the summer of 1977, made the parents feel as though they should have been notified prior to their children attending camp. They also said that if they'd been aware of how secluded 10-8 was, they wouldn't have let their children stay there. The jury ruled in favor of the council. <laughs> Richard Gousset became an extremely active advocate for the victims' rights efforts in the state of Oklahoma, eventually becoming the appointed governor of the Crime Victims Compensation Board. Sherry Farmer also became a well-known advocate for victims' rights, counseling, and teaching others. She and her husband started an Oklahoma chapter of the Parents of Murdered Children on what would have been their daughter's 16th birthday. In 2002, the OSBI attempted DNA analysis from the sperm that was found on the pillowcase at the scene. However, the sample was too deteriorated and ultimately inconclusive. There have never been any other charges brought against anyone else for the murders of Lori, Michelle, and Denise. On June 14th, 1977, Camp Scott closed and never reopened. Mm. And so that the parents of murdered children is, um, I think it was a little over a year ago when we did the t-shirts for the Victims Remembrance Day. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's that organization that has deemed that day in September Victims Remembrance Day. Mm. So, and we donated all the proceeds to that organization, the National I guess, and then they divvy it up however they want. Not that we raised a ton of money, but I tried. No, I mean, that's all you can do. And who knows, maybe maybe it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, yeah, as the show gets bigger, hopefully we can raise more money for it. Mm -hmm. But it's good to know, it's good to have like a case where you think, oh, that's what that's for. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think because, okay, because here's the thing that happened in this case that was so, well, here's one of the things that was so buck wild. The community rallied around Gene Hart so much that the prosecution wanted to move the trial to a more neutral location. Mm -hmm. But the prosecution and the victims, families and the victims don't have that right. Only the defendant does. And it's very important for defense to be able to do that because you should have a fair trial. However, there's not many cases where you see it go the other way. Right. But in this case, it did. And if a jury is blinded to, which again, I just still don't understand, but I guess if they didn't know about the specifics of the other crimes, but you'd think the community would, mm -hmm. that they'd know that he'd been in jail for that. I don't understand how he could be so endearing if you know anything about him. I know. Because he seems kind of like a really kind of scuzzy guy like mm -hmm. that you wouldn't trust your children with. I don't understand it. But it kind of reminds me, the way that the community reacted towards him reminds me of that movie, but it was also a, a case, Bernie, the Jack Black mm -hmm. and Shirley MacLaine movie. And he shot Shirley MacLaine, like, I don't even know. I mean, so many, like 14 times, way overkill. And they had to move it to a different city in Texas because the whole city was like, well... She was awful, and I don't blame him <laughs> for killing her. Yeah. So that we're fine with that. Yeah, exactly. So why couldn't they have done this here? I know, yeah. It's obviously biased, obviously. Mm -hmm. Just don't get it. And I can't imagine if I was part of the family that had anything to do, you know, like the victim's families, if I was any part of that, mm -hmm. you just feel betrayed by your own community. I don't know how... I don't know how people pick up the pieces and still carry on living in somewhere like that because I would be just such a grudge holder. I don't think I could handle it. Yeah, I mean, that would be, be that would be incredibly hard. But I think that what they, what Sherry did and what, oh, sure, I mean, sure, 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 sure. what they all did is we need to become activists. We need to educate people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, educate people and right this wrong and show them what this issue is and how it plays out. I mean, I'm grateful that I don't have to, that, you know, like, I don't envy anybody who has to make these sets of rules, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can sit back all day long and play Monday morning quarterback and be like, well, look what they did here. There should be a law in place for that. Carla, for somebody who is very, very vocal about not liking football, all you use are sports references. Well, I am in a home with three boys, so... No excuse. I just need to get over it. No excuse. <laughs> okay, okay. I actually don't mind football. It's a principal thing, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. 
So, um, but I mean, I'm gonna have to get used to it. I'm learning to catch and throw balls as we speak. The boys always want to play catch with me now. And I'm like, all right, I need to learn. Mm -hmm. I just need to, I need to stop swatting away. You gonna learn today, boy. (laughs) Yeah, I am gonna learn. But, you know, because it's like when you get ready to do anything and you're like, okay, so we're going to do this and then we'll turn right here and then we'll go there. And then there's a detour when you turn right and you're like, fuck, I didn't think about the detour. You know, it's like there's no way you can anticipate every single like latent consequence. Mm -hmm. It's just things that are going to happen as time goes on. I don't envy having to set that up. And while I understand that you can't plan for it all, somebody's dumb ass didn't plan for this. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But like, you know, that's why these organizations are so important. That's why the victims advocacy organizations are so important because we do have to, once those things occur, it's very important to put things into action. Make a change. Yeah. And that takes money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things like the Amber Alert, you know, all these things, like all of that had to be put into law and somebody had to fight for that. So, Mm -hmm. It definitely changes your destiny, I think, in so many ways to lose a loved one to murder Mm -hmm. because your purpose changes. Yes, absolutely. For a lot of people and they become fighters and hopefully help the next people in this situation because unfortunately, murder is a human act. Ugh. Ugh. We're just disgusted with our fellow humans. Yes, well... I mean, it's It's like, I know, I know. Because when you look at it and you think it's so senseless, every single time it's so senseless. Yeah. And again, it's that I'm entitled to have my Mm -hmm. wants met over your needs. I'm going to kill you because I need to get my rocks off. Like, Mm -hmm. fuck that. Yeah, Yeah, that want is more important than your right to live, Mm -hmm. to life. And I mean, come on. Just these tiny children that are just getting started. Yeah, those little letters. Oh, my God. Mm -mm. Oh, my God. And they're sweet girls. Oh, sweet girls. And, like, you think about if, like, kids go to camp now, it'll be a text at the end of the Mm -hmm. night. Hey, Mom. Going good. See you later. I do think there's something important about writing letters still, though. I think that that's really sweet. I do, too. I want to make sure the boys, like, know how to address letters. Yes. Because there's plenty of kids nowadays that do not know how to address a letter. Teach them how to use a phone that's a landline. Oh, yeah. Well, we have all those pretend phones here. Still. Yeah, definitely. I know. They're like, what is this? I know. When I was on Sunday, when I was watching the out-of-towners and she, Goldie Hawn, she's like throwing a fit at the police department at the very end. And she's like, and I'm running with the wolves. And she's like, give you a break? Give you a break? And she's like so (laughs) mad. She's saying everything that happened to her. And then he's like, okay, here's the phone you can use it. And she's like, do I dial nine to get out? <laughs> like all of a sudden her little attitude changes, but I'm like, kids don't, won't know what that means, dial nine to get out. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, even the pound sign thing. Well, like what's the hashtag for on the phone? Hashtag, yeah. So funny. So funny. So there we mm-hmm. have it. Not my favorite to talk about. Uh, kids, man. I feel like, I mean, we uh, ultimately have the last call on what we, what cases we cover. But mm-hmm. with the trigger warnings and stuff, I I never really thought about what my trigger would be, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And not that I've been overly triggered, but these kinds of cases with young kids, they really mess me up. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just so... Yeah, they do. They're so sad. Yeah, they're really, really... It's brutal. Really tough. Mm-hmm. I think to date, the toughest... Sandy Hook. Yeah, the toughest case has been Sandy Hook. I mean, we both were like boohooing. Oh, shit. Yeah. And you never cry. I mean, mm-hmm. it's one thing for me to cry. Yeah. I Now, I couldn't get it together for days. Oh, yeah, that's true. I like when I watched the documentary, I got really upset about it. And then I kind of, you know, let it out, let it go. Mm-hmm. But then when we were covering it. I was like, I can't. I just cannot. I cannot get through this. <sighs> yeah, that was rough stuff. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 